Please note that this episode contains discussions regarding abuse that some may find disturbing. Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, the SE Etc. series. This is episode 260. I am Chris Hanegi, CEO and founder of Social Engineer LLC, the Innocent Lives Foundation, and the Institute for Social Engineering. And this is going to be an interesting episode for us today. But before we get to that, if you haven't heard, we just issued our State of Vishing 2024 report. It's out. We analyzed um, over 16,000, a subset of 16,000 calls for the last year uh, that we did here at the company. And we have some really great data points that can help you if you're looking to protect your company from vishing. In addition to that, in just a few days from after you hear this podcast, uh, Dr. Abby and I are holding a free webinar to dissect that report and talk to you about what it means and how you can use this information. You can get all the information on social-engineer.com. You can see the download the vishing report if you haven't got that yet. And there's a checkbox to sign up for the webinar. So we hope to see you all there. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And this year's report is really phenomenal. We keep adding more and more scientific data points to it. If you like the topic of social engineering, then you should check out our Slack channel. There's over 1,800 people in there every day talking about all aspects of social engineering, from practitioners to just enthusiasts to people who want to learn. We even have a job board where we've had over a dozen people find employment. There's companies come in and post that they're hiring, and people who are looking can post, and then com- companies sometimes reach out to them. So it's really exciting place. It's family friendly and legal. So if you can't find the updated uh, link in the show notes, just let me know. Hit me up on LinkedIn or any other social media that we're connected on, and I'll get you that link right away. I want to take a moment to invite everyone to check out InnocentLivesFoundation.org. If you're not familiar with the nonprofit, we started there at six and a half years old, and we started that with the mission of helping law enforcement agents geolocate people who traffic children and create child abuse material. I'm really proud of the team over there. We're over 520 cases handed into law enforcement right now, uh, which is just truly amazing to me. Because when I started this, I thought there might be like a couple cases we do a year and we can help out a little bit. Never thought we'd be looking at 520 cases. So that is just truly a, a phenomenal number. If you want to support us, you can do that in multiple ways. One, you can come and donate on InnocentLivesFoundation.org, or if you want to volunteer, you can volunteer your time to help us out. And it doesn't mean you have to be in the pit looking at all the bad stuff and reading all the bad things. We have people who help us with marketing, fundraising, uh, education, and outreach. There's so many things that can happen there. If you want to learn more, you can go to the website. If you're a parent or a caregiver and you're looking for information to help you talk to your kids about this problem, then you can find it there also on the website. If you like the music on the podcast because you're listening to it on anything but YouTube, it is none other than Clutch. So go check them out, clutchmerch.com. You can find uh, albums that are coming up, albums that are past, all their awesome merch, and you should just go see them live. That's the best way. Uh, if you know, I've been a fan since I was 17, but Neil, the lead singer, helped me start ILF six and a half years ago. So go show them some love. And last but not least... Uh, If you like the episode and you want to hear more content like this, give us a thumbs up and a like, and please keep your comments coming. Um, The comments you write to us uh, really help us, especially when you give us suggestions on themes and topics that you want. Now, as you usually know, this episode, we'd usually talk about news and things like that, and we don't really talk uh, with guests too much. Uh, Last month, we had Abby on, Dr. Abby on as a guest, because we were discussing the State of Vishing report. But now we're, we're, uh, we have this wonderful guest on. Um, uh, well, let me give her a bio and then I'll tell you what we're doing here. Uh, Nadja El Fertasi, she's a leading figure in fostering emotional resilience with the digital age. She has a comprehensive expertise that spans crisis management, strategic stakeholder communication, and emotional intelligence. She's created a unified approach to enhance the human side of digital advancements. She spent nearly two decades at NATO, which is really funny because it don't look like you're even close to being over two decades old, including a significant role in the NATO Communications and Information Agency, focusing on digital transformation and cybersecurity. Nadja has been a pivotal figure in strategic engagement and communications. This role highlights her commitment to navigating the, and leading through the complexities of cybersecurity and digital transformation. With over 15 years dedicated to cybersecurity at NATO, Nadja has emerged as a respected expert in her field. Her contribution to cybersecurity as a community was acknowledged in Hacking Gender Barriers, Europe's top cyber women by Cyber for Women for Cyber Foundation, which recognized her as one of Europeans in most influential figures in cybersecurity. By the way, congratulations on that award. That's pretty cool. And today, Nadja is the voice behind the EQ Elevator podcast, which I had the pleasure of being on and is really amazing, where she assists businesses in cultivating leadership that's resilient and equipped for the digital ages challenge. Her work is dedicated to shaping a safer, more emotionally intelligent digital landscape where individuals and organizations can thrive amidst technological disruptions. 
Nadja, it is wonderful to have you here on the show. Thank you, Chris. It's wonderful to be here. You know, reading all of that, I'm sure people are thinking, okay, so we have this amazing woman in cyber, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But, of course, with the SE Etc. series, we talk about uh, news and attacks that are happening around the globe. And when I had the privilege of meeting you, uh, you told me something very deep and personal that I thought if we can share it, we might help a lot of people. Do you want to tell everyone why you're here today? Yes, I do. Um, I am uh, in my work. I'm also very passionate about building emotional firewalls against scam. And since a few years, I became more passionate about it. And there is a reason for it because I was quite self presumptuous in the sense that I would never fall for scam. I would never fall for a romance scam because I can see through men. I can see through their manipulation techniques. <laughs> and uh, I was quite vigilant and perhaps a little bit uh, uh, over-biased until I fell myself for a romance scam a few years ago. So I feel ready now. I feel uh, much less shame. Uh, I feel more empowered to share my stories because, as you know, this is a billion-dollar honeypot. People globally fall for the romance scams. It's underreported. And I am sure there are people who are still stuck with feelings of shame and embarrassment. And I want to, uh, my little contribution to your amazing podcast, help them relieve them from these emotions if I can. Well, first of all, it's not a little contribution because um, in my work and, and finding people who are victims of this, rarely do they even want to tell their family about it. They're so embarrassed. They feel so much shame. They call themselves stupid. They don't want to tell anybody about it. So a contribution of you coming on a show where tens of thousands of people are going to be able to hear this episode and, and, and maybe oh, many of them have family or have themselves fell for this. Uh, this is going to be a huge help. But I have a question that that's, I mean, we read your bio. You have amazing awards. You've accomplished amazing things. You worked for NATO. How does someone like you fall for a romance scam? Yeah, I even worked against uh, Russian spies. So can you only imagine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but this is the thing. And this is, I think we should have open and transparent conversations that this can happen to anyone. And um, in my case, it was context related. And I think a lot of people, both men and women, can relate. So this was a few years ago, just after the pandemic. Uh, my business took a big hit. I was recently divorced. I moved in with my son. We were navigating new family dynamics. He was adjusting to this family dynamics. I was struggling to keep afloat and making ends meet. And I felt unsupported. Mm. I felt lonely. And I felt like no one could care less because everyone was trying to uh, show up for themselves. And what we tend to do, I believe, when we go through challenging life situations, we try to find uh, relief or escape our reality. And in my mind, I thought, well, I didn't have Netflix. So I <laughs> said, well, let me try dating app again. I, I don't, I, I, this was the second time I tried dating apps in Belgium. I think the dating apps in Belgium are allergic to my Dutch humor. Yeah. So, but I said, I will try again. And, and I, I mean, I chatted with some people and one man in particular, as if he understood me and saw me and made me feel emotions of feeling connected, feeling less lonely and feeling understood. So those positive emotions. I held on to them with my dear life because they helped me find relief instead of, you know, navigating the difficulties that I were go, that I was going through in those moments. And I mean, two months we were kind of chatting. I was still skeptical. I was like, you know, I, I teach people the difference between love and attachment and, and the hormones that we have when we meet someone. So I was skeptical, but they are very skilled in creating enough suspense yeah. and knowing when to speak to you so they don't come off as desperate, you know exactly what to use. I mean, you know from your own uh, work, Chris, OSINT, so open source intelligence. I 
share a lot about emotional vulnerability of my, my own experiences to help people. So they did their research and they knew exactly what my uh, blind spots were and eventually created that emotional connection. The other uh, aspect, which I think uh, people are often unaware of, is in our childhood, we, de we develop a certain attachment style, right? A relationship attachment style. Now, I suffered as a child, unfortunately, uh, sexual abuse from a pedophile. So I developed this uh, uh, anxiety avoidance detachment style. I didn't feel safe around men. I also was in an abusive relationship years later. So from my perspective, unconsciously, I loved being in love with the idea, but I didn't, didn't want to be close to men. So this is why I actually developed a relationship at a distance without even having mm. seen the man, because subconsciously I felt safe and I avoided intimacy. But at the same time, I was trying to meet my needs for feeling loved and uh, feeling safe. So uh, a few months went by. Uh, when I look back at the story, I laugh because I'm like, how could you not see the red flags? But he was a captain of a big cargo ship and he was going out on sea. And the typical story happened that the motor broke down. And I learned a lot about ship engineering. I did do my research. They have they had a very uh, real website. They had uh, I even though in my emotional connection with this man that I wanted to help him and he was you know their ship was drowning on sea. They they are very well organized because uh, connected the the police of uh, the country they were in. I checked them out. It seemed all legit. So they had all these spoofed websites that didn't seem out of the ordinary. Even though in the back of my mind, Nadia, isn't this going a little bit fast? But because I had developed this emotional connection with him and the fear of him dying because I could, I, uh, could, could help was overwhelming. Now that I was struggling financially was a blessing in disguise because at the end, they only ripped thousand euros. But when I started asking more, this is when I said, and I mean, sounds funny now, but I, I, I prayed to God. I said, God, if you can save them, save them. If something happens, it's not my fault. I don't have any funds more, and this is out of my hands. But I started asking them questions, and that's when they knew I was onto them, and they shut everything down. Uh, the, the, the bank account, like the, their bank, the website, everything was gone. I had screenshots, so I was uh, in emotional denial. I was numb. What I did do, because also of my time in NATO, I filed in a very extensive report immediately, which is really important so they can track these criminals and, and help others. And um, I, I, I tried to hide what happened. And I think what I would advise people to do, what I didn't do, which made my recovery journey a little bit longer, I didn't seek professional help. So I had to deal with the... Uh, trauma response by my own and it affected uh, how I showed up in my business and how I showed up in life and how much I was beating up on myself. I mean, even my son was worried about the captain on the ship. I said, I'm trying to help a friend because I was so like worried about him. Uh, and um, And then I dealt with the emotions of shame. How could I have fallen for this? However, in life, I see things always as two-sided. What can we learn from it? So that experience helped me to finally dive deep into my childhood wounds, into mm -hmm. my issue with love and intimacy. And it just uh, now I'm a much better person because of it. I'm much lighter. I have a very different relationship with, with love. I no longer fear intimacy. I still don't go on Belgian dating apps because I don't like my Dutch humor, <laughs> but I am much more uh, grounded and present and I'm no longer in love with the idea of the feeling of being in love. I get to know people and, and use my discernment skills. So the, there was a blessing in disguise that it helped me heal something I was dealing with for many, many years is this... Uh, uh, childhood wounds on how I saw a relationship and how I was scared to be uh, in a relationship and how it actually shaped my 
my my notion of of uh, what it means to be in a relationship. I have a ton of questions, but um, let me start off with saying I'm very very sorry for your childhood trauma. That's um, not an easy thing to have lived through, and it's a it's even a very difficult thing to even say out loud. So um, I thought when you we didn't even talk about that before you came on the show. Um, no. So the fact that you're willing to talk about your romance scam and also talk about your childhood trauma is um, is quite phenomenal, Nadja. So uh, you yeah, are a much stronger person. You give yourself credit. For. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't planning on to, but when I actually, I think a lot of people went through stuff in their childhood and it shapes their vision and their yeah. mindset about relationships. So I, I felt the need to share it because I think it can help people to better understand what happened to them as a child and to learn how to feel safe again and to you know heal so they they become less susceptible for falling for these romance scams because they do prey on our emotional wounds mm -hmm. so um the first question i have is when you were dating or chatting with this this guy was it voice or was it text how were you communicating with him so that was interesting it was a little bit of both they were very smart and again I was dealing with a lot of stress, so I wasn't necessarily thinking very mm -hmm. clearly. So we were doing WhatsApp, and whenever I wanted to speak with him via video camera, he didn't deny it. He didn't say, no, I can't. But there was always a very legitimate excuse. And when they went, when their ship took off, fictional, figuratively, because I don't think there was ever a ship, <laughs> yeah. he had a satellite phone. And a satellite phone, Lo and behold, did not have any camera. So yeah. he could only, you know, and only when he was going to arrive at shore, he could then call me. And I was, even though in my, you know, rose colored glasses, I still asked questions because where he was going and I was calculating the distance and they were all prepared for it. Right. Mm -hmm. So they had, I think they prepared these scenarios very well in advance. And then they test, you know, they use them uh, on a larger scale. So even the, the the only reason why I actually started to see serious red flags when they were pressuring me to pay the second time. And, and I said, you have to wait until tomorrow because I don't have the funds and I am uh, I'm, I'm happy to call your bank to release the fund. And they, obviously there, there was no bank representative. So that's when they shut me down. Did you ever see him? Did you guys ever exchange pictures at all? Did you know what he looked like? No. So I always, uh, so with the, from a rule of thumb, uh, learning from my emotional embarrassment mistake when I was a teenager, I don't share pictures on, on, uh, uh, messaging. No matter how much in love I am, I did when I was younger, <laughs> uh, but I don't. So I also did not expect him to do so. I only had his WhatsApp picture that was the same as a Tinder. So he wasn't necessarily okay. kind of Brad Pitt looking, but he was a uh, moderate, handsome looking guy. I didn't fell for the looks. Again, I fell for yeah. the emotions he made me feel that helped me escape my overwhelm at that time. Yeah. And when I said pictures, I didn't mean um, intimate pictures. Mm -hmm. I just meant like faces, you know, like faces, like if you no. guys ever, because no. I, I hear that a lot from uh, people who have suffered from romance scams is that, um, that there's very few times that they actually get on camera and that they, they try their hardest to get like nude pictures sent because then they have this, um, this thing over you that they can use for exploitation yeah. later on. Right. Yeah. So very yeah. smart on your end to have that kind of personal rule that yeah. you're not, not going to ever share pictures like that. No. Because so, they can copy my face into yeah. a nude body. I would yeah. still recognize it's still not me because I don't, you know, right. I know very distinct pictures. <laughs> Yeah, but 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 it still can be embarrassing because not everyone yeah, who yeah. sees that picture would know that it's not yeah. you, right? And that's that's exactly part of the exploitation. So exactly. you know, obviously from childhood on, you have uh, all this shame and embarrassment and these emotions, uh, guilt. How did you get past that? How did you actually become? Because have meeting you right until you told me this story, I would never have guessed. In a million years, this would have never been a guess of mine that you went through anything like this because you do not come off as a person who has suffered this much trauma. You come off so happy and positive yeah. and so full of life and everything, you know, that you would not see this sitting on your shoulders. So how did you get from there to where you are now? 
So I uh, I do have a, a gift, which is also a curse in a way. <laughs> so I'm really good at hiding my emotion. <laughs> I think if people knew the trauma and hell I've been through in my life, they wouldn't even grasp that I'm still sitting here and having this conversation. So that is one. Uh, I learned also in NATO to manage my, so I could go in, I could have an internal volcano explode and you would not notice. Mm. I've been very self-reliant ever since I was very young. I am a highly sensitive person, so I'm very sensitive to people. And I've always felt like an outsider. And because of the abuse, I hardly trust, I find it very difficult to trust people as well. So I always kept to myself and I had this mentality, it's me that has to take care of everything and, 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 and just get through it. So I never knew, like I never allowed myself only in my own discretion to act like a victim. Mm. So people, I would never, have, and this is, I think also important for people to understand who have been traumatized, that they feel as a burden to others. I felt like if I would ask, I would, I was readily helping everyone else and being there for everyone else and acting like everything is fine. And no one would know my own suffering because I didn't feel worthy to feel loved and I didn't feel worthy to feel mm-hmm. helped. And I think one of the main trends or threads we see for at least women who fall for romance scam is they don't feel worthy of love because perhaps they've never been loved the way they needed to be loved. They've been breadcrumbed. And I think the romance scam was a blessing in disguise because it finally forced me in transforming and transmuting this idea of love that even though I've never experienced what true love is, that I have to heal those beliefs. I have to change my narrative. I have to fall in love with myself. I have to forgive myself, to forgive my abuser, uh, people who have hurt me and, and what happened in life. Ha- life, we cannot be defined by our past. We have to, uh, make uh, out of life what we have and i'm also very optimistic in general because i feel very grateful for my life there are uh, could be a lot worse there are people who are not as privileged as i am just because of the uh, country i'm born in and and, and my parents uh, I have amazing parents so i i always try to focus on what is going well and what the, the gratitude and that helped me heal. But I must say, I had to go into my shadow side in the sense I had to heal those wounds. And that's not an, an, an um, easy journey. And I just learned to ex- fall in love with myself again, to forgive, mm-hmm. to let go, and to focus on what I do have and to say, okay, I still have a beautiful son. Also, he's the main reason why I'm still here because if it wasn't for my son, I don't know if I would have survived my challenges in life but he uh, he really has helped me to 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 always find the light in the darkness mm-hmm. we can only truly shine our light in when we are in the darkest of our times sounds very philosophical and cheesy it doesn't but that's sound true. cheesy at all it doesn't sound cheesy at all as a matter mm-hmm. of fact um so I mentioned this on a, on a couple of podcasts because I'm like you, I figured uh, at some point you got to be open with your life. I was also in a very abusive childhood. Um, so, uh, one of the things my therapist taught me and something you, you just said, which I think was uh, really vital for people to hear is at some point in my life, I had to realize that my parents did the best with the tools they were given. It doesn't excuse them being evil and abusive. It doesn't excuse it, but. If I just kept sitting there my whole life saying my parents were evil, my parents were awful, my parents were abusive, this is why I have this problem. No, it's not why I have this problem. I have this problem because I wasn't letting it go. And when I got Mm -hmm. to the ability to say, well, they did the best with what they could, it didn't make me love them. It didn't make me even forgive their abuse. It just made me realize that they they didn't know how to do any better. Now, doing better was my choice, right? So changing was my choice. And I think that you said something very similar in that you have to eventually look at what happened to you in the past and you, you, you have to be the one that gets, that gets past it. You said, someone can't do it for you. No one can come in and be like, Najee, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get up and you're going to be better today. That has to be on you. And that's the, I think that's the hardest thing to do when you go through trauma, like what you went through. Yeah. You have to re, re, thank you for sharing, Chris. It's about reparenting your inner child. So I learned that I was trying to have my needs met 
by fictitious people. I didn't allow people to get close to me. So I, I also think you have to take responsibility in life for everything that happens. So I really looked on how am I responsible in what happened to me and in my relationship. So I didn't allow people to, to get close to me either. And I really worked through that, but I learned to just, you know, okay, uh, what happened to you as a child, as a teenager, you may did not have power then, but you do have now. Yeah. So it's like, how do you make that inner child, which we all still have inside of us, feel safe again, feel love? And how, so I really learned to meet my own needs. And what I learned as well, which I think is so important when it comes to Roma scan prevention, as a society, we learn to place romantic relationship on a pedestal because of Disney, because of Hollywood. So it's like you only make it in life when you have romantic <laughs> connection versus there's so much love in so many connections, in the connection I have with my work, in the connection I have with my son, in the connection I have with uh, friends and family, right? I just, love is a feeling we feel. Romantic connections is a part of it, right? The, I think I'm also, I value kindness. So often my kindness is mistaken either for weakness or flirting. And like, if I would be flirting, you would definitely know the difference. <laughs> but... <laughs> I think it's just, it, it, you know, uh, and I don't mind that people mistake because how many people actually experience someone is kind for absolutely no reason. Hmm. And I think, how do we get that back into our core values that we are kind to each other for no reason? doesn't mean you're living in a hakuna matata and you let get people get away with bad behavior. I always say I love a lot of people and half of them are not in my life because this <laughs> is where discernment skills come in. I don't dehumanize them. I don't talk bad about them. Even if they talk bad about me, I just exit the experience mm -hmm. and they are not part of my life experience anymore. Because what I learned when you, when, when you go to so much hell in life, you learn that the most important currency is inner peace. Mm -hmm. And I will do anything to maintain my inner peace. <laughs> I love that. So. You know, I grew up in a, a an era where there was no dating apps. I mean, if I wanted to meet a girl, I had to go to a place and I had to go somewhere where, where girls were. So I couldn't just go on the internet. The internet wasn't available. It wasn't there. Yeah. And I look at um, people now that are they're either young and dating or that are, you know, divorced or single and looking for a, a mate. And these dating apps are, I, I find them to be like horrific. Like they're, it's just like a market. It's a, it's a people market, Right. But obviously this is, and from your experience, a lot of these romance scams start on either Facebook or one of these dating apps or something like that. A lot of the cases that I've heard were people who lost their spouses recently, and then they're on Facebook posting pictures of their, of their marriage saying, Oh, I loved my, you know, 30 years with this person. And then someone reaches out and starts a conversation to be kind to them. So they think, but it's a romance scam. So what from your experience and then obviously kind of analyzing and going through it, um, what, what do you think people can do like safely if they're looking to use a dating app, but not fall into this trap of falling for one of these romance games? Like, how do you balance yeah. that when you're, when you're actually are looking to, to be with someone? Yeah, it's a very good question, which I actually prepared for huh. without knowing, Excellent. because I thought, yeah, I thought, okay, what, well, how can we, because I did uh, re like six months ago, I, uh, attempted my fifth attempt on Belgian dating app. <laughs> and interestingly enough, I met someone who was giving me, who checked out my profile, checked out my YouTube channels. And I, I always, I'm not ashamed to say I'm highly in emotional intelligence, but I am low levels of tech intelligence. <laughs> I'm a dinosaur in tech. <laughs> so he gave me actually some advice about my YouTube channels and some settings. And he wanted to take the conversation to WhatsApp. Now, that is the first red flag when they want to get out of the dating app into another messaging channel. It doesn't always have to be, but most of the time, I think you should take your time. But because we are so on autopilot, I said, yes, let's do it. Let me ask and you a question he, before you go to the yes. next step. Why is that a red flag? Tell, tell us why moving from the app to another app is a red flag. This dating association uh, did research and mentioned that, that one of the number one symptoms of red flags is when they ask for scams is when they ask you to move the conversation mm -hmm. from the dating app to the WhatsApp. Because I think these dating companies are waking up, are monitoring more, are mm -hmm. regulating more, and they don't have any control when it goes elsewhere. Okay. So 
This is where that, that's really I good. That was important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I did my research afterwards. But what happened is because I was an autofire, I said yes. But what then when so this guy was, I think he was Portuguese, Italian, living in Belgium as IT. But when he added me to added it, add English, added it, <laughs> said the English added it me to WhatsApp, there was kind of a uh Indian number. Oh. So and I was like, ah, <laughs> that's all, that is off. So I blocked him immediately, right? Mm -hmm. So this is one. I think uh, second is be very clear on your non-negotiables and intentions when dating. Don't go in there with rose-colored glasses. Mm. So, you know, you make connections, you chat, but try to make a uh, objective for yourself that uh, if they don't ask you out on a date, like physical date in the public sector, it's probably they're not interested, right? It doesn't mean that they're there to scam you. They may have several options they're talking to, but be very clear on what it is that you're looking for as well, right? A lot of people are not looking for relationships. They're looking for a kind of escaping their reality. But don't go into the date, dating apps without any clear attentions because that will um, increase the risk of you falling for mm -hmm. these scams, which happened to me. I was in a chaotic time. I wasn't clear in my mind, and that actually increased the risk for me falling for this scam. And and the third thing I would say, uh, and I didn't have a support system back then, is check with your friends. You know, sometimes we need a reality check, and it's not that our friends are jealous that, that we are dating and they're not. Sometimes we really mm -hmm. need a reality check. So having that second opinion that is more objective can help us because you know if we meet someone we're very visual creatures uh and then we project because we are our brain is wired to make up stories so we feel comfortable so we project already in a long-term relationship and what life could be because this is where we need to learn how do we live in our reality instead of trying to live in a fictitious reality and never meeting it this is where depression often happens because there's a gap this is why mindfulness is so important to teach people to stay grounded and 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 uh, navigate life as life is, not as like we want it to be, which is not easy. Yes, but yeah. it's it's very freeing if you learn how to do it. So, do you think it's important um, to to quickly move from like if you say I like this guy right, or I like this gal um, to quickly move to let's meet somewhere for a coffee? Yes. I think it's important. I did it actually. I mean, I did, when I uh, we were chatting for two days and and um, we met for a coffee twice. Uh, in my mind, it was a disappointment, but I uh -huh. still enjoyed. Right? It's like yes. also saw it as practice to become comfortable again, yeah. being around a, a male figure, and just and also not to have any conceptions. Right? To not right. kind of make up any ideas. But I think it was important because what happens if you delay it? You come up with all these stories in yes. your mind. What if they're like that? You know, yeah. <laughs> you imagine uh, uh, this is where people fall for catfish and for, yeah. you know, blind day and all these things. So the earlier you meet, the faster you have a reality testing and, and, and not go ahead of yourself, right? I think if you are looking for a relationship, then you need to be very clear on your core values, your compatibilities. And it's not only the the chemistry; it's also other qualities. And you need to take you need to take time. I think you, as social engineering master, know this uh, as uh, like no others. Uh, people pretend who they are, but only for a certain amount of time. So you don't really know people until you lived with them or you see them on a consistent basis, and uh, you understand their patterns and consistency mm -hmm. right and i think observation skills is for important which that i am really good at that but doesn't which is why i'm good in in emotional firewalls and in discernment but i it's not good for my relationship because i am because i've been through my trauma i sometimes am too observant when people have invariances of their behaviors and just accepting that you know people are people we make mistakes mm. we, we're not perfect <laughs> And not hold it against them. So it's finding that balance as well. I was just telling a friend um, who is in a dating, a newly dating relationship, and something happened that kind of upset her. And I said, "Ask, ask. 
Yeah. She's like, but that's hard. I'm like, I know, but ask, because if not, you ha- you're going to make up the answer of why it happened. But what I learned in all of my work is just because you could see the what, like I could see a facial expression. I can see some body language. I don't know why it happened. Right? I can see anger on your face and maybe it's because you hurt your back last night and you just moved a little bit. Or maybe it is me or maybe it's something I said, but I don't know unless I ask. Right. So if I don't ask, then yeah. I can't make assumption to know the, the why. Um, but I love what you said about meeting in person because, you know, f- for me, like, I would imagine if I'm going to be on a dating app, I'm not going to put any pictures that I think are bad. They're only going to be my best pictures, right? So, and all my good stuff is going to be in my bio, not anything bad about me, right? So if you meet the person, then you get to know, okay, were those pictures real or were they, you know, filtered? Like is, is, is the personality that he's displaying what he has in his bio or not, right? And you get to learn the real, because online it's easy to be whoever you want. And it's easy to think about how you're going to say it when you're typing it and how funny you can be or how, you know, provocative you can be. That's easy to do when you're in person. That's harder because you're just, you're just who you are at that point. So I like that you, you give that suggestion and and to do it public. Like don't say, Hey, come on over. Let's hang out. It's like, let's go to a public spot for safety. Don't let anyone in your, in your house, like even after X months, because, uh, uh, like I said, uh, 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 I was also in an abusive relationship and when I met him the first weeks, it was love bombing. It was like yeah. the most innocent, sweetest guy you can, like I just, for me, it was like I was living in a dichotomy. <laughs> what happened? And this is how nar- covert yeah. narcissists operate, which I also tell people I'm not in any way giving any advice about narcissism. I'm definitely not an expert, but I am a victim. Uh, the, some of the most soft-spoken people are the most narcissistic people mm-hmm. alive. So you have to be very careful, and we have to teach people to become observant again. Yeah. To don't to not judge as fast, to not jump to conclusions, to activate their critical thinking skills, and not let the illusion of social media or of pictures. I mean, just look at LinkedIn, right? I, uh, yeah. I'm going to be a little bit sarcastic, but how many uh, success stories do we see? How many awards do we see in cybersecurity? And yet yeah. ransomware goes up, sex extortion yep. is causing uh, boys to kill themselves. And I'm not saying we should only focus on negative, but we need to disrupt because we're definitely not going in the right direction, in my humble point of view. No, I, so I, I think agree. it's how, how can we leverage optimism but also, you know, remember to ground ourselves and yeah. to, to, to disrupt and to teach people to be human again. And to, and this is what I attended the sex torsion webinar yesterday where parents share their story, which is, was heartbreaking and empowering at the same time. But one of the fathers, uh, who, who was, a, who was an official, uh, also government representative now, he said, we, if we want to teach our children to navigate and embrace shame, we have to stop shaming uh, our, ourselves as adults. We have to stop judging each other uh, and be very quick to to humiliate and to shame and blame. Because how are we going to teach our children to accept that, right? Otherwise, they will keep taking their lives at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. So I think this is an uh, this is why I'm also uh, I also agreed to to share my story because I'm not ashamed anymore at all, or much less. But I, I'm very uh, convinced in general in life that what makes us human is our joy and love, but also our emotional mm. pain. And it's only when we share it that we can stop reverting to violence on the political level, at societal level, mm-hmm. at the business level, and at an individual level. Many people are at war with others because they are at war with themselves. Yeah, I would agree. My um, When I... What I tell my kids is that if you are interested in someone, go hang out with them, with their family or with their friends. See how they treat their parents or their brother or sister. See how they treat their friends, how their friends treat them. That will give you a great indicator of what they're going to be like in private. You know, because if they, if they, if they can't get along with their brother or sister, they're not going to treat you nice, right? If they're treating their mom terrible, that's going to, that's going to be a great indicator, right? So if they have a friend group that's all sarcastic and not your kind of people, it might be a good indicator that there's some danger, some red flags. 
you gave some really great tips today, some great advice for people um, to to listen to and to hopefully get some help um, and hopefully feel empowered. You, um, uh, my one last question I had is in the in the middle of your story, you said that you wrote a comprehensive report. Where can people report things like this when it happens to them? So just before I answer that question, just to pick up on something you said, one thing that I also learned to do, and I think as a general rule in business and personal life, you really get to know someone immediately when you tell them no, (laughs) when you don't give them what you want. Then how they treat you back. I see this uh, like in in business, for example, I get loads of sales offer and I get it. Mm -hmm. I'm an entrepreneur himself, even though I approach it differently. But when I tell them no with kindness or not now, if they ghost me immediately, they were never interested uh-huh. in yep. offering anything. Yep. Right? But the people who actually say, no worries, uh, I'm here to help and let's stay in touch are the people I learn to trust and to say, ah, okay, they are truly in love with their mission. Yeah. Uh, also in dating, if you tell them no, right? Mm-hmm. Normally, if a man is really, I'm speaking from a feminine perspective, female side, if a man really wants you, if you tell him no, he will try harder. Mm-hmm. Right, and I don't mean that in a physical way. I mean, no, if yeah. they, for example, ask you out on a date and you say no, he will respect that. So never think, and we need to teach young girls this: that saying no or being assertive will push away the right people, the right guy. Yeah. He will not. You are worthy <laughs> to get the treatment and love you deserve, and you have to have your own standards in life. So saying no it. is the fastest way to know people. That's so getting back to your piece question on, yeah, I wanted to, to, to add Thank that. You. Getting back to your question, what I just did is actually, I went on the Google for like a kind of Belgium uh, policy. How do I report romance camp? And it was very easy to find. So they have here in Belgium kind of a reporting point mm-hmm. uh, where I then immediately uh, filled in the, the report and attached as much information and photos. I never heard from them right. and I never don't yeah, know what happened, don't. but I do know because they get probably loads of complaints and reports. I do know that they use this data then to track these mm-hmm. criminals and, and the work that you do with your foundation. You also know how important it is to have these yeah. reports in order to track these scammers and criminals. Yeah, and then once they get caught, a lot of times those reports could be used as evidence to put them in prison. You know, if they exactly. have five, six, seven, a hundred reports on the same person, they, you know, he can't be like, oh, that was just a one-time deal, right? So it's, it is important. Yeah. Naja, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today and uh, just opening up. Um, you are amazing. Honestly, I, I am so, I, 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 I loved you before this conversation, but I can't, <laughs> and my respect for you has gone through the roof uh, with everything that you've been through and the kind of person you are now. And uh, to have like your, I, I know your podcast all about emotional intelligence. It's not about revenge. It's not about getting back at the at the bad guys. It's it's uh, just a wonderful example uh, for for everyone out there. So thank you for coming here and sharing that all with us, and and coming on my show and sharing it here because I think this is just going to help so many people. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Chris. Life always takes a very interesting spin mm-hmm. because when I was walking in the park with your book and listening to your podcast. I dreamed about getting on your podcast, but I never thought it would be for this. <laughs> so it's like uh, we get what we what we need in life. But I'm very honored, and I'm very. It's the first time I opened up so deeply. But I uh, really hope that anyone who's listening and who hasn't gone through the experience but knows other people, uh, you know, who are susceptible to hold space, to judge less, and to learn to love each other more. Uh, and to be kinder because we never know what someone is going through. Like you said, I'm really good at hiding emotion, but no one has any idea what I've been through. If people and I don't want, take that as a pride of, uh, a no, I understand. of honor, by the way. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Yeah. Um, if people want to know more about you, they want to follow you, they want to see what you're doing now, what's the best way for them to to connect? So I'm, as you see, I'm very active on LinkedIn. I love sharing and uh, I love storytelling. So please connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm also looking actually for people who are interested in joining my mission in building emotional firewalls, because I really think that we can leverage emotional intelligence and develop solutions to start with the most vulnerable uh, group, which are uh, kids, because they have low levels of emotional intelligence. 
So if you are uh, someone who's interested in that, would love, you know, for, for you to get in touch with me. I share a newsletter on LinkedIn where I share my personal, I have a lot of uh, emotional embarrassments as well and, and stories that I share openly uh, to help people find some peace. And um, uh, I'm quite active on social media, sharing both the business side of uh, cyber resilience, but also the mental health side of uh, what it means to be human in digital age. I love it. And for everyone listening, I'll put the links to Nudge's uh, LinkedIn and Instagram in the show notes. So you don't have to remember and write it down. So you can just go there and find uh, best ways to connect with her. Again, thank you for coming on the show. It was just wonderful. And thank you all for listening uh, to this episode. And I truly hope that this uh, helps even just one of you listening uh, to to deal with and, and work past that shame and guilt of, of these type of scams and uh, spread the message on this one. Get it out to people and other communities and other areas that aren't listening to this podcast right now just to see if it can help others. Uh, thanks for joining us this month. Uh, until next month, and when we come back and we'll have another uh, version of SE Etc., please stay safe, and we'll see you then. Mm-hmm.